John, huge moves at ESPN. Not only that, we're talking about RSNs and MLB, of course. Our big get today, Doris Burke. That's a big get. And the big get for the world of sports media is trying to figure out how to say your last name. John Iran Iran, Iran of Iran. Sports Iran? Business Journal. I believe French him guy. and Marshawn. Marshawn do a podcast. Yep. That has great mm-hmm. information. Mm-hmm. We started out on rocks with these guys. Yeah, a we, bit. we started out on rocks with these guys. <laughs> Should have maybe sued them for defamation. For they were saying some negative stuff okay, about so us. <laughs> you know, should have thought. Now, now that works. we know, now that we know how the world works, right? Yeah. But big fan of the reporting that both Uran and Marshawn do, and the Sports Business Journal. And we're back. The Marshan and Oran Sports Media Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshan, sports media columnist for the New York Post. He's John Oran. John <clears throat> Iran. 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 The media reporter for the Sports Business Journal. And John, we have the big get, Doris Burke, Hall of Famer. Uh, ESPN has an all-women's broadcast this Wednesday. Uh, and she's going to be a big part, of course, of that. Uh, and then she does the NBA Finals on radio and big time as they get. So Doris Burke. Uh, in a little bit. All right, but Andrew, let's go right to topic one. Pat McAfee, it's John Arand. John Arand, it's very simple. It's only six letters. Come on. And I actually think we've been pretty good. To, I had a run in on it with Pat a few years ago on Twitter uh, when he was campaigning for the MNF job. Um, and I said he shouldn't do that. Anyways, but since then, I've been very positive towards Pat McAfee's. I don't know what he's talking about with that and referencing the Brett Favre suit. Uh, Favre is suing McAfee um, over, you know, things he apparently said. And so uh, McAfee having fun with that. Uh, and we're having fun uh, with him uh, mispronouncing your name, John Oran. Uh, <laughs> we got to get that. Who's up? Who's down? Who's up? Who's down? All right, let me get started. Who's up with the bullet? Burke Magnus at ESPN. Firmly solidified, in my opinion, as the number two to Jimmy Pitaro at ESPN. If Jimmy Pitaro gets hit by a bus, Burke Magnus is going to be uh, the, the the next uh, leader of, of ESPN. As part of the reorg, he's no longer going to be overseeing the rights and the rights relationships. He moves his role over to the uh, dealing with the company's programming relationships. That means heading up all studio shows, live events, news gathering, investigative journalism. Uh, the talent office, audio, digital, social media. And what this is doing, in my opinion, is trying to add on his experience level. So he's not just a relationship rights guy. Now he's overseeing all other aspects of the business so that when he ends up uh, going into the, the the top chair eventually, he has enough uh, experience to be able to do that. All right, John, my who's up is Rosalind Durant. She's the other big promotion from these ESPN changes. She comes back from Disney. Uh, She'll be the EVP programming acquisition, taking on uh, a lot of Burke's responsibilities. So when you look at Rosalind Durant uh, and the future of ESPN, she's going to have a vital role with the NBA on the horizon, uh, UFC on the horizon in terms of deals to be made. Uh, And so she comes in and when you look at the pillars that, They've created here at Disney and ESPN. I made an analogy the other day. If you have Pataro as the chairman, he's Hal Steinbrenner for the Yankees. Uh, (laughs) Burke Magnus, kind of a combination of Brian Cashman and Randy Levine. Levine, the president of the Yankees, Cashman, the GM. That's what Burke Magnus is. Then if you get to Durant, she's the Aaron Boone. She's like the manager uh, of the team. Uh, And so very important role for Durant. She comes back to Disney, and that's where your power structure is. That's the central uh, pillars of power now at ESPN, uh, which is going to be our number one topic. Uh, we're going to get deeper into this and what this all means in the future of ESPN. Uh, but first, let's get to who's down. Well, you know, importantly, uh, Andrew, Roz and uh, Burke are very close. They launched the SEC network together. She uh, she's uh, has deep relationships. Uh, that's uh, you know what she's known for. They're going to be still working very closely together on the league relationships, on the rights relationships, and it is a very big move uh, for for uh, Roz Durant. My who's down? You, you'll have to forgive me. There's not a big sports media component except for every Sunday I watch this guy's team uh, in the fall on on, on television. 
But my who's down is Dan Snyder. What a miserable week. That culminated in the DC Defenders, the XFL, a full crowd screaming an expletive, uh, F Dan Snyder, the whole crowd cheering it uh, th- th- throughout the game. It was a, a, a really bad week for, for Dan Snyder. And for the first time, I've always been a skeptic. I didn't think he was actually going to sell a majority interest in, in the team. And now that's starting to switch. The news that, uh, that came out that he is refusing to engage uh, uh, Bezos, who, uh, again, it's a relationship business. It's the theme of this pod. He has deep relationships in the commissioner's office with all the other owners. Uh, the owners are taking a look at that and saying, like, now Dan Snyder is doing something that's lowering the potentially lowering the value of his franchise, which is potentially lowering the value of our franchises by a billion dollars, five hundred million. You, 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 you name it. Once it once he starts taking money out of these other own, owners' pockets, you're going to see this start to uh, to to speed up. Uh, I'm hoping that this isn't wish fulfillment. Dan Snyder is the most unique person in Washington sports history. I can't find one supporter of Dan who says that he's misunderstood, who says that, uh, you know, uh, he's reviled by the market. And I I think that this is that we're finally starting to see the end of the road for him as the owner of the commanders. My who's down when I borrow from Randy Moss, who's famous for saying you got mossed while I'm doing you got layered. So in the new reorg and, and when these corporations make you know have reorganizations, the biggest thing you don't want to do is be layered. Uh, that's basically the definition of going the wrong direction of who's down. And that's what happened to Norby Williamson, Dave Roberts, and Stephanie Drooley. They all got layered in this new reorg. They were reporting to ESPN's chairman, uh, Jimmy Pitaro. Now they're going to report to Burke Magnus who will report to Jimmy Pitaro. Uh, they still have important roles, but... Steph Drooley, Norby Williamson, and Dave Roberts, you got layered. You got most. Yeah, corporate America is like, that's like, they hate when that happens. Um, I was a little surprised to see it, actually, So that they got layered, though. I wasn't necessarily surprised to see it. I'm sure they're not happy with it. But Jimmy Pitaro, in this new role, had probably 100 people reporting to him. I, I don't know what the actual number was. He needed to cut the number of people reporting to him, and so you know that's what happens when you have a big. You know, the, the, uh, he's overseeing all of ESPN now, uh, and, and including you know the affiliates are, are reporting into him. Ad sales is sort of reporting into him as as a dotted line. Uh, ESPN Plus is now back under him, and he just increased like by threefold the number of people reporting to him, and so he needed to make uh, make it make a change on that. But it does take us into the topic, Andrew, and it's been a topic from the of uh, the first podcast that we did, and it's the future of ESPN. It's not whether or not there's a, there, there, there's a clear trend line that they're going to go direct to consumer, and the question is when that's going to happen. And th- there was there was a moment where uh, it looked like it was going to happen sooner than not, and we we've talked about this before as well. The idea that they needed to build subscribers and, 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 and things were going digital. Well, they've, they've realized there's not a lot of money in streaming. And there is a lot of money still in ESPN. And, I, and, and you have, it's fascinating right now, I think, actually, in, in the sports media business, you have Fox and you have ESPN. And they are trying to to keep the cable bundle going as long as they possibly can. And then you have NBC and you have CBS, and they're streaming the NFL games over you know on Peacock and on on Paramount Plus, and they're making a lot of their content available at the same time on these streaming services to where you don't have to be a, a, a cable subscriber. And so I, I I'm starting to get the sense. Not that they're never going to make make the mothership available direct to consumer, but it might take a little longer than than I thought maybe you know four months ago. You're like a flippity flippity flopper. I know it's from back to. But so are these executives, though. Then, like, all, all yeah, of a sudden, yeah, I still think it's in the like we had. It was the over under five years of a year ago, so we're still got four more years in terms of my 
over three and under. a half three and a half three and a half all right three and a half i'm still very confident it's going to be within three and a half years i think one thing that when we look at espn and its future i think that's lost a little bit it's not just a cable channel right there's a lot of entities associated with espn and i think you can walk and chew gum at the same time so they they are on all these channels um, they've, you know, made moves like we talked about with McAfee, with the Mannings to try to get cooler. Um, you know, they upgraded the Monday night booth with Buck and Aikman. So they tried to, you know, create that brand, um, in, in a, in a way that, um, is younger and cooler. Uh, and so I think that is the biggest question though, when they go direct to consumer and how they, that, that thread that they, that you have to go. I, I think it's different though, when you look at ESPN. And you compare it to what we're seeing locally, what Nesson did, charging $30 a month uh, for their programming last year. I think largely that's also to keep a stake in the ground that you own those digital rights. Yes, is trying to get their um, their direct-to-consumer up and running here in New York by opening day, which is quickly approaching uh, it's for the Yankees. Uh, and so... And they're, you know, they don't, we don't know a price that MSG network announced it's going to be $30 um, a month, uh, you know, and they have like no programming for six months of the year. When you talk about games and stuff, so I don't know who would pay for it during those six months, but I feel like those are all designed to keep you on cable. I think when ESPN does it, they're going to be designed to try to get some people to do it because I think their audience that they could potentially reach is, is bigger. And um, I think when they, when you talk about cutting the cord, like if you love the Knicks, you know, you're probably already watching the Knicks. They, you know, so if you, if you're ESPN, you're offering a lot of variety of things. Um, and so I just feel like there's a bigger audience for that. And I think the price point might be a little bit lower than this. Let's try to keep people on cable price point that the regional sports networks are going with. Uh, and so I think two things here. So there's a, they, they're a bigger platform. It's not just the cable network, number one. And number two, um, I think they will thread that needle uh, sooner than, than later still. To your second point, you know, when ESPN goes to direct to consumer, they're going to try to get as many direct to consumer uh, uh, subscribers as they can. We we agree on that. They're not they're not going to go direct to consumer at like seventy dollars a month for the you know, exactly for, make it like some family. crazy number that just is sort of to pushing totally agree with you. By the same token, when ESPN goes direct to consumer, that will hasten the decline of the of the cable bundle. Uh, precipitously. The only thing holding the cable bundle together is live sports, live news, and sort of live event programming. And once the biggest purveyor of live sports says that you can you can watch you know all the the entire NBA through the finals with, with, without a, um, a a cable subscription, uh, th that's going to really make the uh, the cord cutting trend. Um, what, 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 what's a bigger word than trend? <laughs> it, it, it's it's going to make it drop off, off a cliff basically. Yeah. But the one thing I will say though, and if I'm ESPN, if I'm Disney, this is something that you have to be consumer first. Like, I feel like the, what, what the streamers are trying to do is, you know, like look, look at MSG network. I feel like they're not really going consumer first. They're trying business first. How can we make the same amount of money? And I don't think the same amount of money is out there anymore uh, for them to make. Uh, it's just not, you, the math is, you know, if you've ever seen any of the math in terms of what they were getting from every subscriber, even ones on cable who weren't watching as compared to, um, what they could get streaming wise. Um, so that's where I think yes. So I, I, so, you know, we've, we've discussed this a lot. I, I, that's where I think ESPN will be different. I think the price point, that initial price point, and then they'll raise it. I mean, then, but, but the idea will be to, to get a substantial amount of people in there because the thing about these games and I had this with a very smart um, regional sports network person recently, like who's not getting these games that wants them, right? That's the question they think you have to ask yourself if you're an RSN going direct to consumer and, and numbers that I don't think they're really public, but numbers you hear haven't been great for any of these services. It doesn't seem like there's people who want these games who aren't getting them somehow now. And so like, so who are you serving? And I mean, everyone's going to do it. It's just, are they going to do it effectively is the question. So if you talk to ESPN um, uh, executives, and th this is my viewpoint as well, so it, it resonates with me. If you're going to be consumer first, let's stick with the cable bundle. You don't have to. You don't have to subscribe to 20 different, uh, you know, uh, streaming services to see to get your soccer fix on. You know, it's like you just buy the one bundle. 
and you get everything. If they can keep that, keep their business going because uh, uh, as well, um, they're going to they're gonna ride that as long as they can. And th- I, th- there's a belief. Eric Shank said this when we had him on as the big get uh, in, in, in Phoenix. There's a belief that that the cord cutting trend is going to level off. Yep. And, and, and if it levels off, if it levels off in your ESPN, why would you go direct to consumer? It leveled off. We already, we, we, we have you this. Would. Right. No, you think you wouldn't? I think you would at that point. It depends on how low the, the, it, it levels off at though. Well, why wouldn't you want to add these? So if you have 50 million people, let's just say, who are getting cable, why wouldn't you want to give a, the other people who don't have cable another way to, to access and pay for your product? Because as, as you make that available and I don't need to get the, to, to subscribe to this cable bundle, like the, the the money that they're getting from cable, which is a ton more than they would ever get from streaming, uh, is it w- will drop down. It but like let's say you're in New York, right? And you want the Yankees, you want ESPN, you want the Knicks. So you're all right. Let's just say the Yankees cost. We don't. There's no price. This is not. Let's just say they're thirty bucks a month too. So then you're sixty bucks in, and you're not even getting the Mets yet. You got the Yankees, you got the Knicks, you got the Rangers, um, you got hockey. I, I don't know. You do have the Nets as well, but like. You're already sixty dollars in. Then you're gonna pay for ESPN. I don't know. It keeps going. And if you want soccer, then you need an NBC or CBS component with you know Paramount Plus. It just adds up. And then people say, "All right, why don't I get? Why don't I just get the cable bundle?" Andrew, you sound like me. Finally, you see the benefits of the cable bundle. Like I always that said that. My, I've been on listening that a to long you time. go on, warmed my that. heart. Okay, yeah, right, maybe. So. <laughs> All right, before we move off of ESPN, um, you know, I think another thing we should mention is that we always talk about Fox and I think they've done a great job kind of, you know, punting on streaming um, for, in terms of subscription, but they've been doing that because Fox is so strong. I mean, ESPN, the other thing that they have is reach and that comes from ABC and that's going to be very helpful going forward as well is that, you know, they kind of cover everything you'd want. And when they go into these rights negotiations with the NBA, for example, and Rosalind Durant's in there, they're like, all right, you want the finals on broadcast TV? All right, we have ABC, which is already, it's already on. We have cable, we have streaming. They can offer every avenue that, you know, entities will want um, to potentially have marquee events that you want broadly. And then if there's niche sports, there's, you know, you have ESPN Plus, and you have other ways to, for them to deliver. So I think they're well positioned. I think if you Andrew, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with that any any more. And in fact, I'm a. I, I think anybody who listens to the spot knows I'm a big believer in traditional linear television, good old fashioned TV. In 2031, there's going to be one way to watch the NFL, and that's on broadcast television. The the the, the NHL Stanley Cup Finals. They're on broadcast television for, you know, going through 2027. The NBA is the the same thing. And I guarantee you the NBA's next deal, the finals will will remain on broadcast television. The leagues prioritize that reach big time. It makes sense. Those are their biggest games. You want to reach the most most people possible. And uh, you you want to make sure you don't limit it. And and that's where like streaming is a little bit different um, for sports because, you know, with broadcast TV, that's the best reach model there is. And as great as Amazon and Apple are at reaching people, they're still in, in what, you know, the digital world has changed because you can reach distributions, you know, um, basically zero with the internet. Broadcast TV still is number one and hard to beat because there's no price and you don't even really need, you don't need cable. You don't need anything except the TV. Um, and so, uh, and some bunny ears if you want. So uh, that's, that's a huge advantage. All right, let's move to uh, the other topics. Um, MLB, local TV, regional sports networks. Uh, let's kitchen table where we are, John. Give, give us, give us what you know. Okay. Here's what we know. Uh, next week, uh, the, 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 the week around March uh, 15th, Diamond Sports Group, which owns all the Bally Sports, uh, is almost certainly everybody. One hundred percent of my sources believe that they're going to file for bankruptcy. Uh, it, it it seems absolutely certain to happen. We got a quick glimpse last week at how MLB plans to handle this. They hired Billy Chambers, who was a top executive with Fox, who ran the RSNs. He went over to Sinclair for a little while as well. Uh, he started February first. He has since made a bunch of hires. He hired uh, Doug Johnson from AT&T Sportsnet Pittsburgh. 
He hired Greg Pinnell uh, from Bally Sports Regional Networks. He hired Kendall Burgess, who also came over from uh, from Bally Sports, where she was VP of Technical Operations. Baseball is slowly building out a a local production group that when they end up getting these rights, they're going to be prepared to hire local talent hire and, 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 and produce these games. The big question is going to be uh, how these negotiations are going that they're doing with distributors to make sure that these games remain on traditional linear television. I'm not hearing great things right now, but there's still some time. It's, it, it's early, still early in the negotiating process. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see where that's headed, but uh, it's a long road to hoe. We're seeing right now where it's headed. So overall, where does this end up though? Like, let's just give me a, a year from now, two years from now, where do you project it all ending up? I don't want to guess actually, okay. but, but he, here's, here's what, what I'm looking at. The NBA media deal that comes up in 24, 25 and how, because those are the national rights that are up, how they incorporate the local rights and the local digital rights within, w- within that, that, that uh, contract it's going to be really interesting to, to, to see. I mean, the, the, imagine if you were ESPN and they say, okay, great, but you have to take these local rights and have a drop down menu on ESPN plus to where if you want to watch wizards games, you know, you, you, you can do that. ESPN, like they want the national rights. They'll agree to that in a heartbeat. Imagine Turner, you know, on, on bleacher, uh, it, it would be non-exclusive. So like if, if Amazon comes in to get a cut of, of the NBA, I could see where the NBA would be like, we just need to do whatever we can to increase the distribu- distribution of these games through our national partners. And it's, it's almost like an MLS model with, uh, w- w- with, with Apple, to be honest, where the, the concept of actually watching a local game I mean, you'll watch your local teams, but you won't necessarily watch like the local production of that game. It'll be, you know, the, 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 almost national productions that, that will be available. No blackouts or anything like that. I started this by saying I didn't want to predict and I just predicted, but that's, I thought, that's where I expect this is headed. Well, you you're go good, first. Andrew. You, you get me going. I can see why you're such a good reporter, man. There you go. All right, John, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how this all turns out with MLB. Uh, it's one of those kind of percolating subjects. Uh, that we've been talking about. You had this at the beginning of uh, years, like the biggest story that's sweeping up. I remember the hurricane analogy. Well, the hurricane is starting to really, the, the winds are getting a little bit uh, harder right now. The palm trees are going, are, are, are bending over uh, bad. But Andrew, let's, go, let's get right into Doris Burke. I can't wait for this interview. John, joining us now, the big get, Doris Burke. And if you're a big get, you got to be a Hall of Famer. She got the Kirk Gowdy Award. Uh, winner a few years back. Uh, so she's in Springfield Basketball Hall of Fame. Of course, she's a mainstay on ESPN, calling the top games and working the finals as the analyst on ESPN Radio. Wednesday, all women's NBA broadcast, Mavericks and Pelicans in New Orleans. Beth Moens will be on play-by-play. Cassie Hubbard on the sideline. And then behind the scenes, all women. Uh, ESPN's done this before, uh, and they're going to do it again this Wednesday with Doris as the analyst. Uh, Doris, first off, thanks for joining us. Uh, oh, my pleasure. My right. pleasure. First, we'll start. We'll start serious. When you were calling the MSG Network games, you're calling the Liberty. I was the first one uh, to write that you're really good. Now, so my question is this: Do you attribute <laughs> all your success to me, or just some of it? Virtually all of it. It's you know, there's very little doubt in my mind that that article sort of triggered the trajectory for me, Andrew. No doubt. <laughs> I appreciate that. So seriously, though, when we look back or you look back at your career, you went to Providence. Obviously, we're a great player there. All kinds of assist records. Um, I think you majored uh, in health services and social work. Um, Coming out of college was like, how did you how did this broadcasting thing evolve and happen for you? Yeah. You know, my friends and I will talk about this. If you could have seen me in college, you would have said, oh, yeah, broadcasting is a natural, painfully shy if there was a public speaking element to any course I took. Bad skin, bad hair, bad clothes, bad teeth. That naturally translated to TV. Wait, it Um, sounds like you're describing Marchand there, Doris. (laughs) (laughs) But I'll tell you the truth, and I've said this, you know, in many ways, my career is a happy accident. Basketball has always been the most important driving force in my life since I was seven years old. Picked up a ball. It's responsible for an education my parents would have never been able to afford. I'm the last of eight, uh, very working class family. So um, 
And the year I left coaching at Providence, they decided to put Providence College Women's Basketball on radio. And that was literally my first foray into uh, into this business. And thankfully, no one was listening when I started. No one. And so you got lots of repetition before anyone could could hear your mistakes. And then you guys know that sometimes life is about timing and opportunity and women's basketball coverage was starting to explode. And it's just been a gradual progression from 1990 moving all the way to, to where we are now. So that does sound like a, a happy accident, like you said. Like When you were a kid, you weren't like, I want to be one of those people that are on TV. Never, never. Although I have a friend that one of my closest friend from high school um, told me that she distinctly remembers when we were kids, um, Dick Vitale had become this sort of phenomenon. And she distinctly remembers me saying, someday I'm going to work with him. And I just... I don't remember saying it. I find that funny because obviously, you know, I did have the opportunity to work on Dick Vitale's college basketball team as a sideline reporter for a few years. And um, I, I really marvel. And I one of the pivotal moments for me, obviously, was the formation of the WNBA. Um, I'm always indebted to women's basketball. I've played it. I've coached it. In 1997, that was the first time, guys, a woman could make a living between the 30 games I do in the summer and the 30 games I would do in the winter as an analyst, be the Billy, uh, the Billy Packer, the, the Bill Rafters, the Dick Vitale, because I was getting about 60 games between those two. And I was also very fortunate in this way. I was working for six months and I was also raising my children and at home for those six months. And, you know, I see all these women now, you know, the Cassidy Hubbards of the world, they're trying to navigate, you know, beginning of family, young children, Ryan Rucco comes to mind. Um, and I remember those days. Um, it's not easy. It isn't easy. Because I think people don't understand the travel. You know, you're not emailed from place to place. And it's mm -hmm. not just one game that, you know, it's not one day when you're doing a game, generally speaking. You're there. It's pretty much a three-day affair, at least, right, to, to, for it, the it, travel. It, and how do you balance that? Well, you know, the hardest part, obviously, if you're college basketball, which I was for years, um, you know, was March Madness. And I remember watching, I was working with Rebecca Lobo at the time, and, um, and she was, you know, it's very hard for children to wrap their minds around, oh, March Madness, that means you're going to be away for four nights, mom. So what Rebecca would do would say, okay, you have four sleeps. And so her husband, Steve, would sort of check off the calendar. There's one sleep, two sleep. You know, it's for young children, it's not easy. Um, it's worth it. You know, my children say, my daughter's an attorney. And she said, you set a great example for me, mom, about what it takes. You know, you have to work hard if you're going to find success in your profession. So listen, it's like, there were moments I cried. You know, I remember distinctly one time leaving for a long stretch and my son is standing at the doorway with tears. But Andrew, before you got on, uh, John asked me where I am and I'm at my daughter's house here in Philadelphia and uh, her son is under the weather and I said listen I don't fly until 5 30 let me come he's not feeling well he's better at home but I watched her walk out the door to go to court this morning and I know what she's feeling I know what she's living Doris one of my uh favorite parts of your career has a uh, little to do with you actually it's, it, when Drake put on the shirt, uh, it's a women, woman crush every day. Yeah. What, uh, where were you? As it take us through sort of your experience of, yeah. of what happened there. It, it was a crazy night because at the time my daughter's in law school at Villanova and we're at, um, she actually lived with a colleague. He had a cottage that was part of his house and she lived there. It was a few miles from Villanova. And she's in the kitchen making dinner and I'm sort of in her den, you know, just, I don't remember exactly what I was doing, but I got a text from a colleague who was in the truck that night, Michael Molinari. I've worked with Michael for 30 years. We used to do a lot of Big East games together. And the text says, you're about to blow up the internet. And you know what my first thought was, John? What stupid ass thing did I just <laughs> say somewhere on some broadcast? And uh, he said, just turn the game on. And I'll be honest with you. I mean, I know he's a phenomenon, but obviously a little bit different generation than, than I am. And when he goes on television and, you know, is at that presser and they run that back. And then I think it was Israel Gutierrez who did an interview with him. 
I'm looking at my daughter, she's looking at me and she grasped it before I did because there's a moment at which she said, oh, mom, I don't think you are understanding exactly how big a star and how big a deal this is. And I didn't, I didn't until my phone blew up. And I said this, you know, it was a year later, John, before I actually met him. I did a Toronto game a year later. I was sitting aside my screen. At some point in the first half, we make eye contact. He comes over to the broadcast table. This is captured, of course, as everything is on uh, social media. But I just said to him, I said, you know, I don't think you intended it for this reason, but I really appreciate your expressing respect for my work because I do think it somehow changed the minds of maybe anybody who might have been hesitating out there accepting me as an analyst in the NBA. And he said something like, oh, I, I don't think you understand. You know, I, I really enjoy what you do. So that was, it was an unforgettable moment, certainly. Did I hear you correctly? Is that the moment that you realize that you made it or, or? Yeah, I mean. I would have I... said that, that you made it well, well before that, to, to, to be honest, which is why he had the shirt on. Yeah, I don't know that I've ever thought consciously in my head, you've made it. Listen, you guys know this, um, and I've said it before. If I had, if I hadn't had, I don't, I don't remember when Twitter came into being. Do you guys know the year? Was it, you know, early 2000s, whatever it was? It's like, I'm not, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, it's like around 07, maybe, I'd yeah, say. I was going to say 09, so like right around there. Oh, oh, 09. So the beauty is I had 12 years under my belt. And I've said this often because young people are so affected by social media. I don't know if I would have been tough enough to endorse some of the things I endured early in social media had I not had that 10 to 12 year period where I was building a foundation of confidence in this building or in this business. Because here's the facts, like it started in a very small way, but I've been calling men's college basketball since 1999, the Atlantic 10 when Bob Stites hired me. There's been, a, early on in particular, there's been a lot of pushback there's been this gradual, you know, sort of gradual acceptance to the point now, and this warms my heart. The, the fact that men of my son-in-law's generation and younger, they don't even blink. I'm a part of their experience. They don't, it doesn't sound harsh to their ear. And I'm guilty of this because what happens when we hear something strange? What's our first reaction? We pull back, we go, oh. What is that? So I understood some of the pushback, certainly. And I think you hear this in my broadcasting. I am mindful of the fact that I've never coached in the NBA or played in the NBA. You know, I, I, I'm just mindful of it. And I, I am very careful with how I do my job. When you look at what your big break was, what would yeah. you say it was? I mean, I would say several. The WNBA's formation, because what that did, Andrew, was it stuck me in the New York media market. And, you know, executives and decision-making positions were hearing me at that moment. So I'd say that was one big moment. Um, I, I said this to Bob Stites, who still works here in Philadelphia. Um, he was the associate commissioner of the, of the Atlantic 10. And uh, I had a couple years under my belt as the analyst for the New York Liberty. And he called Mike Green and said, I'm considering three analysts for my uh, lead analyst on the Atlantic 10. And he mentioned my name and Mike said, well, and I'm not giving you a verbatim Mike Green, but Mike Green said to him, I don't know if you want to go there, but Doris is the best analyst amongst those three. And Bob told the story uh, to me in the third year or second year. I just said, what was the reaction of coaches when you told them you were going to hire me? And he said, you sure you want to know that? And uh, I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'm not going to tell you verbatim, but I'll tell you what I said to them. She's, she's my choice. If you have a problem with her come March, you call me and then we'll discuss it, but we're not gonna discuss it until then. And maybe one big moment, the great John Cheney at some point, maybe in January of my first year said, that young lady you have, she's all right. And, uh, and I've always appreciated that. And I'll tell, if, forgive me, I'm, I'm kind of going on and on, but John Cheney, I had one unbelievable moment with him. I worked the Atlantic 10 Women's Championship. Dawn Staley has won it. And then I'm heading to Philadelphia, the old spectrum, I believe, to call the Atlantic 10 Men's uh, Conference Tournament. And I walk in the building and right away I'm hit by two or three people. 
John Coach Cheney wants to see you. And I'm thinking again, of course, I'm thinking, oh boy, what, did I, what have I said? Well, I said something and I cannot remember the word, but I find him right away. And I said, I figured let's be proactive. I find him right away. He pulls me behind a pipe and drape. He's come off a, a press conference and said, Coach, you know, somebody said, you want to see me? He goes, Doris. He goes, last night on the 810 Women's Championship, you said X. You used word X. He goes, there's no such word. You've been hanging around black people too long. <laughs> and I fell out. I absolutely fell out. I mean, the great John Cheney. And I don't know. I just, I've always appreciated his support and uh, and all the coaches. And I've always said this, like, with coaches and players, when the conversation is the game, gender goes out the window. Because they all, everybody loves the game. Doris, what was the word? I, I'm trying, I think I might have said conversate. <laughs> like, I don't, I think, I, I really cannot remember the word, but he had me die and laughing behind that pipe and tray. I've told that story a few times and I just, it cracks me up. Now, Doris, you've been a broadcaster for a while now. Have you ever thought about getting back into coaching or leaving sportscasting and how close did you come? Yeah, um, you know, I've had some feelers out there. Um, people have asked. Um, I've actually had one organization ask about, like, you know, would you ever consider, um, you know, the other side of things? And I, I just said, no, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be where I am. And uh, I, I love what I do. I love the preparation of it, and I love the live action of it. I mean, there was a time when I left coaching, to be honest with you, Andrew, that I missed. Um there is something very special about working collectively towards a goal and, you know, sort of experiencing the highs and lows of winning and losing. Like there is nothing probably as special as that. There was a point at which I've always believed that broadcasting afforded me a greater balance, believe it or not, between parenting and, and um, then coaching did. So. And was the role in the NBA, WNBA college, where was the role that you could have had? Yeah, actually, a little bit of everything. Okay. Yeah. And you want to tell us who? No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so, Doris, the uh, who do you pattern your style after? Is it is there is there anybody that you're you're sort of stealing stuff from in terms of that? No, I, Bar I'm borrowing. I should say, not stealing. Yeah, you know, yeah. the one thing I would say is I. <laughs> I, I think the audience knows if you're feigning anything. And um, I will tell you, I had my favorites. So if you remember when we were kids, watching college basketball would have been appointment viewing. And I remember the Dick Enberg, Al McGuire, Billy Packer trio. And believe it or not, my favorite of those three was Al McGuire. I just sort of love the flavor that he added to that. Um, I think what makes our number one team work so well is you know, you have Mark Jackson, when he goes to break, one of the best to ever do it because there's style and there's flair and there's information. And then you, you have Jeff and, you know, in every big basketball moment, they deliver the basketball goods. I don't think you can be anybody but yourself, John. I think that if you try to be somebody else, it's like trying to, it's just, it's just your, your kids know if you're not being real, just like the audience knows if you're not being real. And uh, there are people I like and enjoy more than others. Um, and maybe stylistically, there's some similarities there. But no, I don't. I, I just do just do the game. If there was a do over um, in your career, what would it be? The do over. Oh, boy. I, I think I would have had fun a little bit earlier. And by that, I mean, you know, because, as I've said, I did color analyst work on men's college basketball so early in my career, probably about, you know, eight to nine years in, and then started doing a little bit of analyst work on the NBA. That that little nudge in the back of my head, just what I mentioned to you earlier, having never played or coached those sports, that I was always so serious. And, and it, I mean that by like attire. I always wore a, a blue blazer. Some of that was financial. You know, I'm raising two kids. I'm married. You have economic concerns and some of it was also by design because the man next to me was generally wearing a blue blazer and a power tie um and i remember distinctly watching the i think it was the olympics with my son and 
were just sitting next to one another enjoying the sporting event. And the, and the announcers had this unbelievable chemistry between them. And they were having a good time. And you could hear it. They were laughing. And my son just looked at me and he said, Mom, what I think you failed to understand is when you're having a good time, we're coming with you. We're having a good time with you. Dick Vitale used to hammer that into my head. People aren't here to learn how smart you are about the sport. Yes, you have to be able to, to deliver in the moments where there's something strategic going on that's working or not or whatever. But that's not why people are tuning in to hear how smart you are. They're, they have a vested interest in the team or they're looking for diversion. This is in some ways entertainment. And it took me a really long time to figure that out. And a lot of it was my own insecurity, to be honest with you. And now I'm just like, well, <laughs> there's plenty of people who don't like me and some who do. So let's just have fun while we're here. All right, Andrew, I want to finish with uh, w with one last question. Uh, Doris, I want to talk about your new role. Uh, you're a new grandmother. Yes. Uh, how great How great is that? Oh, it's like, you know, I, I knew, and I'm, I'm sorry to all my colleagues who I told over the course of my daughter's pregnancy, I couldn't wait because they heard it ad nauseum. <laughs> Um, but it's better, it's better than I even expected. You know, I'm here today, my grandson's not well, and he'll be a little bit cranky, and it'll be the best thing I do all day before I travel to New Orleans. That's awesome. You said you didn't know when you made it. Well, Kurt Gowdy Award winner, you're in Springfield Hall of Fame. Uh, that's got to be, you got to feel like you made it when, you, when, you, when you're doing that speech, I would think. Yeah, you're going to make me cry because I, I remember thinking like, Standing there, you know, being a part of that night and, and getting overwhelmed emotionally, like not in a million years. There have been so many roles. I remember telling my kids the first time I got assigned to the uh, Big East tournament as a sideline reporter, I said, you guys, you got no idea how big this is. I played in the Big East. I coached in the Big East. There's not, I grew up watching that tournament thinking I'll never be a part of it as a broadcaster. And I went from, from sideline to analyst. And just there's been so many moments where I've been like, this is absolutely nuts that I'm sitting here. There's still times, guys, I'm calling an NBA game, and these athletes will be doing something extraordinary. It'll be the middle of the playoffs. I'm thinking, what? Mike Green and I talk about this all the time. You still have imposter syndrome. You're X <laughs> years deep in your career, and you still have imposter syndrome. You're going, wow, I am really here. Yeah, Green's in the Hall of Fame, too. I guess you got to get into other Hall of Fames before you don't have that imposter uh, syndrome. Uh, <laughs> Baby. Doris, thank you very much for joining us. The all women's broadcast on Wednesday, Mavericks and Pelicans. And then of course, you know, we see every week um, and then through the playoffs and then doing the finals on ESPN radio as an analyst. Um, uh, incredible career. Uh, I appreciate you giving me credit early on there and um, <laughs> best of luck. We'll see what we can do for you in the future. Guys. Thank you. Thanks Doris. See ya. Andrew, my big takeaway, I loved her Drake story. I love the idea that she didn't know that she was a big star. I love the idea that she was like kind of sitting around the kitchen her kitchen and had her daughter had to tell her that like her life was about to you know, to change over the next several days. I mean, that that to me was I, I just I loved every part of that story. Yeah, I thought that was really good. And I, I found it very interesting how uh, she was very pleased that she started her career before social media. Um, it is difficult uh, for anybody, uh, women especially in this day and age, just people just saying stuff to you left and right. And, you know, until you kind of get used to it, uh, it's hard to deal with for anybody. Um, but I thought that was very interesting. Um, and then also, uh, you know, how she had to manage everything. Um, and I am dying to know which team wanted her to be a coach or executive. I think that's interesting. I'm gonna have to try to dig that one up. Uh, yeah, she kept that close to her. She wasn't gonna give it up, or I would. Yeah, I don't blame her. Yeah. I don't blame her. She didn't take I the do. job. Come somebody on, somebody reached getting... out. You may as well say, "Ooh, right." I guess so. Yeah, I like specifics, but she was very good. All right, that's gonna do it. A lot of ESPN talk. Um, big get. Uh, Doris Burke was excellent. John, um, we want to thank Chris Mason, AC Wyatt. They put this together every week, um, and we appreciate that. Um, and uh, if you can like it, if you can rate it, um, and if you can review it, it's very appreciated. Yeah, thank you for listening. We'll see you next week.